please join me in the prayer for illumination. Eternal God, you speak through poets, inspiring us to seek a deeper peace. You change our lives in Jesus, challenging us to follow your way of truth. Your Holy Spirit moves us to respond by spreading the good news of your love. As we open scripture now, God, be in our listening, our understanding, our living. Amen. The first reading is from Psalms 122 and 121, found on your pew Bibles on page 571 and 572. I lift up mine eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He keeps you, he, he who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within the gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord of our God, I will seek your good. <clears throat> the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning's text is about a hill that didn't appear to give much help at first. It is a scripture that we read on our first full day of pilgrimage in the Holy Land. The interesting thing is the lectionary section actually is, is what's printed in your bulletins, Luke 4, 14 through 21. But if, it, if we stop at 21, we miss the surprise ending. And so I will be reading all the way through verse 30. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And now for the surprise ending. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this pro proverb, Doctor, Cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown, 
But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them, and went on his way. The word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, the word of God within us. It was only when Jesus said that he had been sent to all, that God chose people outside the community to heal, and to feed, and to serve, that the insiders got mad, drove him up to the top of a cliff, intending to throw him off. But Jesus somehow passed through the midst of them and continued on his way, bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and letting the oppressed go free. Gotta love a surprise ending. Over the past two weeks, a group of 25 members and friends of this congregation, along with 23 folks from Knox Presbyterian in Cincinnati, Ohio, have been on pilgrimage in Israel and Palestine. This morning, several of us will share reflections on that experience. One thing this pilgrimage really drove home to me is that God is in the surprises. Seth and I both fretted a little bit before we left. We, we didn't have a solid itinerary. We didn't know exactly what was happening at every moment of every day, and we were warned that the reality of the political situation in Israel meant that the itinerary might just change at a moment's notice. And the changes came. They actually began even before we left the States. We arrived in Chicago for our flight through Austria to Tel Aviv, and were informed that the flight was canceled. Miraculously, somehow, they had managed to get all 25 of us on a flight together with an 11-hour layover in Zurich. We were offered rooms at the airport in Zurich so that we could get some sleep, but the entire group decided to forego that in favor of an adventure. We got on a train and headed to Bern to see a bit of the Swiss countryside. Watching this group of 25 people aged 39 to 93, some of whom we didn't know before the trip, all with strong personalities and different points of view, just go with the flow and enjoy the adventure in the unexpected. It felt like a message from God. This is going to be fine. Whatever happens, this is going to be fine. And it was. There were surprises and changes to the itinerary, and those surprises were some of the places where I felt God the most. There was the day we went to renew our baptisms in the Jordan River, and we couldn't get anywhere near the water because 15,000 Eritreans, mostly refugees, were there commemorating Christ's baptism. And then as we watched them joyfully jump in the river as if they could not wait to immerse themselves in this outward sign of God's love, three doves flew overhead. There was the day we were supposed to go into the Dome of the Rock, the mosque atop Temple Mount with the iconic golden dome. In the end, our permission to enter was rescinded, political complications, and we were not able to go in. We still went to the top of Temple Mount to walk around and see it from the outside. The four Presbyterian clergy on the trip were walking together and talking about how we each see and experience the Holy Spirit. Just then, a young woman named Rachel approached us and asked us for our story. What brought us to Temple Mount? What did this place mean to us as Christians? She was a student at Hebrew Union College studying to be a cantor, and at our request, 
There on the side of the temple, she sang to us in a combination of Hebrew and Yiddish. And as she walked away, Seth remarked, and that's how I experienced the Holy Spirit in these human encounters. I could tell a million more stories, but I will stop at just one more. I experienced the presence of God in the surprise visit of a donkey to our worship atop the Wadi Kelt, also called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. There was a family of Bedouins selling jewelry and kafiyas to visitors at the site. They observed quietly as we sang and read the 23rd Psalm. And suddenly, one of their donkeys came into our circle and stood right next to a member of our congregation. She stood stock still with her head bowed and tears in her eyes through the rest of the service. I saw God in the gentle face of that donkey, and I saw God in the gentle response and openness to the visitor in our midst from the person she stood beside. And I look forward to hearing where some of my fe fellow pilgrims saw God in this experience. Good morning. My name is Alan Parfit. During our trip to the Holy Land, we visited many sites traditionally associated with Jesus' life and ministry. There was the tree that Zacchaeus is supposed to have climbed, the location of the angel's visit to Mary, and so on and so on. Many of these sites have been commemorated by the construction of a gigantic church. So we have the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth, next door the Church of St. Joseph, where his carpentry shop was. We have the uh, Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. All of these are beautiful and impressive buildings and I enjoyed visiting them. But although Jesus was not exactly a humble man, he led a humble life and I had trouble seeing him in these mighty buildings. Instead, two other sites moved me more. One of these was the traditional site of Jesus' baptism on the Jordan River. That was a great story, but it's not my story. Maybe somebody else will tell it. My story begins on the second to last day of the trip, when we left the hotel early to go to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. We climbed up to the third holiest site in all of Islam, the place where Muhammad is said to have ascended to heaven. Naturally, there's a huge and beautiful mosque on the site. Our intrepid and well-connected guides had obtained permission for us to take a peek inside during the interval between prayer times. But the Israeli military thought otherwise, so we could only walk around the Dome of the Rock and admire it from the outside. Then, down a narrow alley to the Western Wall, arguably the most holy place in all Judaism. That too was an impressive experience, and we were able to go right down and touch the wall, provided that we men had our heads covered. After we left the Temple Mount, our skillful and indomitable driver, Samer, maneuvered the huge tour bus through narrow streets and tight roundabouts, through the Vale of Kidron and halfway up the Mount of Olives. Very deposited us at the end of a narrow street with walls on both sides. Most of the tourist, tourists walked up the street and turned to the right. We walked up the street, tur went left, through a gate marked private, unlocked with a huge old-fashioned key. This was the Garden of Gethsemane. It was neat, but not manicured, studded with olive trees, some ancient, some just sprouts. Of course, there are various theories about where Jesus actually went on that fateful night, and the actual location will be forever unknown, but I didn't care. This felt right to me. The gate was locked behind us so no one could disturb us as we made our way across the garden to a small amphitheater in the sun at the back of the property. There we worshiped as we did every day of the trip. During the silent meditation, I was able to think about Jesus' feelings as he prayed in the garden that night. A man of total power, voluntarily giving himself up to disgrace and death for our sake. When they reached a place called Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Then he took Peter and James and John with him. 
Horror and dismay came over him, and he said to them, My heart is ready to break with grief. Stop here and stay awake. Then he went forward a little, threw himself on the ground, and prayed that, if it were possible, this hour might pass him by. Abba, Father, he said, all things are possible to thee. Take this cup away from me. Yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. We all know what followed. Then we took communion. Like you, I've taken communion hundreds of times. It's part of our custom of worship. Never was communion more meaningful to me than on that spot. Amen. I'm Norm Van Donselaar. The concept of an iceberg is sometimes used to describe Ernest Hemingway's writing style. Or at least that's what I learned eons ago when I was taught that sort of thing. The idea being that the story is, there's much more to the story than what's written. And I suspect I speak for my fellow travelers in saying that our collective experiences are much broader and deeper and richer than the few we're able to share with you this morning. Forgive me for reading the balance of what I'm about to share, for, share with you, but if you understood how my little pea brain worked and my embarrassingly bad public speaking skills, you'd thank me for that. Over the course of our journey, the olive tree became symbolic for me on a couple of different levels. It's claimed that it was first cultivated in the Mediterranean region some 7,000 years ago and has long been considered sacred. The olive branch was often a symbol of abundance, glory, and peace. It is one of the first plants mentioned in the Bible and one of the most significant. Genesis 8:11 says that the dove came back to him in the evening and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf, so no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. It was soon evident that the olive tree was an, a ubiquitous feature of Israel's landscape. Jumping ahead in time to late afternoon this past Tuesday, we stopped somewhere between Jericho and Jerusalem, as Chrissy previously mentioned, and as we often did, sh shared a short worship service, including a spontaneous and peaceful visit by the resident donkey. The implications of that resonated with us all. The elevation was high, the surrounding topography starkly barren, yet stunningly beautiful. Scripture was the 23rd Psalm. Seth shared some thoughts, including that a fundamental, fundamental biblical theme is that God is always with us, and encourage us to remember the peaceful and comforting landscape to draw from at some future time when life's challenges work to overwhelm us as a reminder of God's constant presence. Throughout the passing days, for me, the olive tree also became a symbol of God's both immediate and enduring presence. I should mention briefly that I felt his presence most closely during our reaffirmation of baptism standing in the Jordan River. The next morning started with, the, as Al mentioned, with an early visit to the old city of Jerusalem, followed by a short westerly ride through the Kidron Valley to Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane, which Al also mentioned, of course, included olive trees. Since returning, I've read that several trees in the garden are claimed to date back to the time of Jesus. I assume because of their longevity and constant pruning, the trunks of older trees grow strangely large relative to their branches, almost cartoonish. There are trees with massive and beautifully gnarly trunks that have been pruned so extensively that the tops are almost table-like, with only a few healthy but odd-looking branches. It occurred to me that these old trees are symbolic of our lives and our relationship with God. As we age and grow in our faith, we also experience myriad challenges, broken relationships, unemployment, health problems, guilt from bad decisions, and the loss of loved ones. But with the assurance of God that is always with us, 
that the trunk and foundation of our faith grow stronger even as God prunes the branches of our lives to heal and restore. He doesn't abandon us or cut us off at the trunk, but prunes the adversity and prepares us to be something stronger and to bear maybe less but better fruit. Before and during our trip, I was reading the book Through My Enemy's Eyes, envisioning reconciliation in Israel-Palestine. A sentence I happened to read on the return flight and thought appropriate is this. God ultimately a redeemer who at great cost takes that which is broken, restores it, and brings it back to a state of wholeness. At the beginning of the trip, Seth shared a piece of paper with the names of everyone traveling and a few selected prayers. I continued to carry that folded piece of paper in my shirt pocket. The prayer by Thomas Merton grew, um, became particularly meaningful for me and partially paraphrases the, psalm, the 23rd Psalm. The last few lines are, Therefore I will always trust you, though I may be seem to be lost in the shadow of death, I will fear not. For you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. For me, the olive tree will forever be a symbol of that. Good morning. I'm Susan Hanselman, and um, Israel is a long way away. <laughs> we learned that big time um, on Friday when we came home. It was. Um, but going, it was, when we went to Switzerland, it broke the thing up, and, you know, I don't think we knew what we were getting in for on the way home. I'm here to tell you um, the two, you know, the two things that I, well, it was on one day, and it was um, the re-baptism, re yeah, renewal of our baptism, at the Jordan River. We had gorgeous weather almost every day except um, the first day. But on the day of the Gir Jordan River uh, thing, after the, all the buses and everything the day before, we went back. And um, it was, you know, you, you think back on your first baptism. Of course, lots of you were babies, maybe. But mine was only three years ago. And... Um, and then to stand in that freezing water and um, up to our knees. And Seth did, well, Christy and Seth and, and Janet were doing it. Janet was Ohio. Anyway, it was, it was so beautiful, uh, the, the surroundings and the, the meaning of it. it, would, it um, you, start, you just sort of knew that there was something out there more. And uh, the, and on the same day, later in the afternoon, we went, I think it was near um, Jericho. We went up to the, what they called the, the Valley of Everlasting, or the Valley of the Shadow of Death, which of course is the third, uh, the 23rd Psalm. And, it was a great, it was a big observation thing. Um, not, well. So anyway, we, we, when we get out of the bus, we walked up to this sort of a small incline. And I didn't look and I was busy with my cane and all. And when we got up there, I had never seen anything like that, ever. We were in, the desert, you know, and it was um, it was a precipice sort of valley, but it was a, like little pyramids of sand, little almost waving, and it was everlasting all around, ever as far as you could see. It was. I thought later that um, you know when you're a little kid and you go to Sunday school and you hear about heaven, I thought, I thought it looked like heaven. It did. And then after, um, 
And we were all, it was a worship um, service that we were having there. It was beautiful. It was, the sun was about to, was still up, but it was going down. It was just a beautiful time. And then after that, Seth spoke, and I thought he, um, I don't know, I think it was right out of the top of his head. I don't know. And uh, I, t I told him afterwards that I was, I was proud of him. Because I think, see, I think that Seth is my child. And, uh, but again, that place was, you know, it's very moving to be uh, in those kind of places. And then I also wanted to say that uh, it's very, I, I'm very lucky to be able to come here every Sunday. You know, in my, at my age, it makes my life wonderful. And I know so many of you, and, it, and I know lots of you, I might not know your name, <clears throat> but I, I do, I like to come. Thank you, thank you, God. My name is Eva Hanka. Now, I do appreciate the opportunity that I could go with this group to Holy Land. Uh, I have uh, been wanting there, even though I was a little apprehensive about it, but it went very well. And I am quite happy about it. What I hoped to get is absorb uh, the spirit of the holy places that people come to uh, for ages in order to worship and to venerate. Uh, the spirit is bound to be on those places and I hope to absorb it. And uh, those, of course, are the places that Jesus, where Jesus lived, walked, and uh, taught, he did his ministry, suffered, died, and uh, uh, rose again. It's also the Holy Land is the place where the whole history of the monotheistic religion uh, took place where it unfolded from Abraham through Mohammed up to the uh, present difficulties that there def definitely are. Uh, I, I did catch this spirit all right. Uh, our trip, of course, was not a sightseeing trip. It was a, a, a pilgrimage. So we worshiped on the way. And some very moving and uh, uh, meaningful ways. On the boat on Lake Galilee, where Jesus crossed the lake, where he calmed the waters, also by the Jordan River, where John the Baptist took uh, did his work where he baptized Jesus. We got into the river up to our knees or so and we renewed our baptism. Uh, we also worshipped on Mount Carmel and most of all in the Garden of Gethsemane. We had a Lord's Supper there and it was just awesome. In the place where those old, thick olive trees looked at us, those same olive trees that were alive already at the time of Jesus. So this was uh, just an awesome worship. And this pretty much did that for me, all that spirit of it all. Of course, we also did some sightseeing, and that is we saw uh, quite a bit of the archaeological sites, uh, the grand ancient city being excavated, coming back to life. We could see, and of course, uh, I being a, a teacher of classics, appreciate uh, seeing these places again, these uh, excavating, excavated cities uh, that uh, People built a long time before we 
came to the land with the, our smartphones and, and our uh, new technology. So it's rather, uh, it makes you rather humble again. And uh, yeah, those places uh, like Caesarea, uh, Magdala, there are excavated cities. And uh, then uh, uh, Bet Shean. And uh, there was one more, but what? We also visited a refugee camp full of people who were driven off their, uh, out of their homes by the Israeli occupation. Uh, these uh, people settled in those uh, houses. They uh, made a wonderful lunch for us. And of course, they do have a big problem. The refugee problem is big. But uh, it's not a topic for today. Today, I uh, would just uh, want to express happiness at having done it and getting out of it what I wanted. Good morning. I'm Jeff King. Uh, most of you know my wife better than me. <laughs> um, as I was thinking back on this, I was thinking to the question that we were asked when we had our first meeting, which is kind of what are our aspirations, our expectations for the trip. <clears throat> and I remember that one of my aspirations for the trip was to get to, to know the members of our congregation better, uh, which is important to me. And the second was that I wanted to visit the Holy Land to help increase my, my faith and my understanding somehow. Like, I wasn't quite sure how that was all gonna kind of work. But as we kind of thought about things and prepared, we were given a list of readings. And one of the readings was uh, a book called Blood Brothers, which was written by Bishop Elias Shakur, um, who we had the good fortune to meet uh, and talk to while we were there. And one of the quotes in that book, which came back to me as I was thinking about this presentation, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that people come to the Holy Lands to see what he calls the dead stones. Um, but what they really need to do is they need to come and become the living stones and the, the, the living stones to rebuild the church. And I think, I think about that, I thought about that a lot during our trip. And so, although we did see many, many interesting and amazing kind of dead stones, um, including things like the Nativity Church, which we heard about, which is Christ's birthplace, and in Nazareth, um, the Wailing Wall, the Dome of the Rock, the Church of the Mount of the Beatitudes, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I mean, kind of on and on. There were so many amazing things that we saw. That's where Christ's cruci uh, crucifixion occurred. But for me, I found that sort of touching this spot or touching that rock or, you know, a mark on the floor um, that commemorated uh, an event in the past um, w really did not move me. I mean, it was really neat, but it wasn't, I, I, I expected that I would have a different reaction to that than I did. Um, I will say that I was deeply affected by being in that place, meaning in, in the Holy Land, and, and the two places that I felt very strongly were when we were floating, we were in a boat and floating on the, south, uh, the Sea of Galilee, kind of looking out at you know, the Mount of the Beatitudes and places like that. And also when we were on the Mount of Olives and we were kind of looking down into the old city of Jerusalem with the sealed eastern gates. And so I, 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 the, the place had great importance to me um, in connecting me to, to the passages of the Bible and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But I think as I think about when, when I was most moved that it, it was really the people that we met kind of along the road, so to speak. Um, and there were so many, uh, but the people that, that I remember that really um, were meaningful to me, we had our guides, one of whom was a third generation Israeli Jewish guide. Our other guide in the West Bank was a Palestinian Christian guide and they shared so much of their personal stories and personal life. Um, we met international UN peacekeepers when we were on the Syrian border at the Golan Heights. 
We met Israeli, I mean, not Israeli, Italian observers in Hebron who were there with cameras to kind of document what was, what was happening in that city. The Palestinian refugee family that was mentioned, I think, by Ava, who invited our group into their home and fed us, which, by the way, was amazing food. But um, just to, to, to share that experience was, was amazing. And finally, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I was really touched by a Palestinian shopkeeper uh, in, he, in Hebron that we met in kind of the falling darkness of night as we were kind of heading back to our, our, uh, our bus. And, and he had actually opened his shop up because the word had gotten out that this group of, of, of pilgrims was kind of coming around and uh, had beautiful things. But he, he talked to us, and I just remember um, what he said to us. He said to us, to the group, he said, please pray for us, please remember us, and please tell our story to the world. So um, to me, I think these living stones and their stories, along with the living stones from our church who became my brothers and sisters along the journey, are where I really felt the Holy Spirit working in me and what changed me and inspired me to to in my walk of faith. So thank you, Seth and Chrissy, for the trip of a lifetime. I'm Jill Barnum. I'm taking perhaps a little different tack, but I want you to understand it's a very hopeful one. On our, on our clear, bright Sunday in Palestine, from our hulking bus, we watch the streets crowded with laughing teenagers, loitering granddads, and a few moms tugging crying toddlers. This human part so familiar in this so foreign land. We were on our way to worship with Palestinian Christians in a small Presbyterian church. We sang and wept through How Great Thou Art. We marveled at hearing John's chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world, and prayed the Lord's Prayer. All offered up our English mingling with their Arabic. But when the sermon unfolded, for me, the past converged on the present in that tiny sanctuary when the minister harangued us with his fire and brimstone gospel. I was raised, and we raised our three children in a literal, spiritual, uh, scriptural, mining fashion. Listening to the sermon, I fell into old ways of taking on the pressure and fear of legalistic standards even started to pen notes to try and rightly make sense of the message. But then I clicked the pen shut, tucked my journal in my pack, pulled the translating earbud away and slipped my arm around my friend Wendy's shoulders. A bit of, a, a bit of backstory. For years now, I have felt bitterness and anger about preach, preaching like this, associating the fundamentalist tone with the death of our son and the squandering of my limited time mothering him. But that morning, those feelings started falling away. Our son, Brayden, died by suicide five years ago. How Great Thou Art was the opening hymn at his funeral. Of course, my husband and I, we began wandering in a desert. Like those dry rolling hills we pilgrims navigated in the West Bank, but at some point in that first year, we began taking care of ourselves the way Jesus would. 
and stepped into the cool, welcoming first res sanctuary. Coming back to the present. At the end of our Holy Land Church service, I watched our pastoral staff graciously and sincerely thank this pastor and his congregation for including us affirming our commonness in Christ, if not our theologies about Christ. We generously and sincerely spent our shekels in their closet-sized gift shop. We exchanged emails and offered to stay in touch. And here's where the hope is. That morning, I was gifted with the understanding that this Palestinian Christian minister was answering a well-meaning call to save us from our sins. I forgave him and all the old preaching fools that have crossed my path, and I forgave myself. Something about hearing all those different languages all over Israel and Palestine at the edge of the River Jordan, in that tiny chapel, pouring from yarmulke-capped heads and broadcast by Khalifa-draped hearts. Drew me up into the noisy throne room we are welcomed to boldly enter. I heard my diligent nine-year-old prayers and my prayers as a desperate mom of a mentally ill child. I heard the prayers of a man tricked out of his land decades ago, and those for electricity in his current slum living. I heard the prayers of a condemned rabbi pleading to God while his comrades slept nearby, his now heavenly prayers advocating, advocating for every searching soul. All of us with our conflicting perspectives, our blinding wounds, our quenching grudges, I know our God understands and hears. Believers from every time and place. These pilgrim experiences are central in most practices of faith in one form or another. And of course, there are different sites and destinations and different stories and different sources of inspiration. In the end, the power of pilgrimage isn't just in the exterior journey to particular places and experiences. It's about the interior journey of the heart, a heart open to companions along the way, a heart open to the Holy One, whoever moves among us, ahead of us, beside us, behind us, and deep within us. That connection makes pilgrimage more than just pleasurable sightseeing vacation. So, so see, friends, that every day of our lives, every ordinary home and street and routine can be the itinerary and the map for our pilgrimage of living faith. From the beautiful Sea of Galilee to the stone floor synagogues and streets where Jesus' feet may very well have trod, to the valley of the shadow of death, the chilly, muddy Jordan River, all these places, they were ordinary places. They were common experiences of people just like you and me long ago. They have been made holy by how people came to know God in Christ among them there, in the face and the voice of Jesus, and in companions that we meet there still today. God is with us. Indeed, that's the promise of the whole Bible. That's the promise of Jesus' life and ministry and death and the depths of human suffering. And that's the promise and the power of the resurrection making his 
presence real among us now as we lift our eyes to the hills all around us, to our lakes, our streets, our homes, our gardens, our moments of stunning beauty and goodness, our miracles of joy and life bursting with the abundant radiance of love, and our moments of struggle and fear in a lost and barren wilderness where the shadows lengthen or darkness deepens and the way through is utterly is utterly strange and unknown. God is with us in gigantic churches and humble human interactions and glimpses of heaven in hills and in sunlight and shadow. God is with us as enduring as an olive tree that's gnarled and cut off with just a few shoots now coming out. God is with us in people we meet all along our roads, the guides, the peacemakers, the laughing teens, the loitering adults. God is with us as past converges with present through profound hurts to renewed and powerful hope. So we have sung now of our experiences in Bethlehem and Nazareth and Gethsemane and Jerusalem. Dear friends in Christ and companions on the journey we share, may we all be glad when it is said to us, let us go sing a song of God's love in Kalamazoo and wherever we may be led by circumstances of life and the inspiration of God's Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.